All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to week three of Our Stories, a six-week international virtual festival celebrating our common human and the unique beauty of diverse experiences. I'm Kamal Rahman, an AACC advisory board member and co-curator of Our Stories Virtual Festival. We will be recording this event. This event is part of our fall 2020 season, Cultivating Connections, which focuses on the connections we all have to each other and to nature. First up is actually a bag of wraps for a bag of rice, an installation created by artist Fang Huang, specifically for AA and CC's art, uh, Asian Arts Gallery. It engages East Asian gardens to integrate histories of empire wealth privilege and exploitation responsible for ecological extraction and displacement. Due to the 2019 pandemic and all too real example, the very issues we are discussing uh, or howling illuminates access to the exhibit is virtual through AANCC's website. You can go to www.towson.edu slash Asian arts and select programs ex and exhibits on the sidebar. We'll put that in the chat. There, you will also find an informational PDF about the exhibit and a Zoom background you can download. If you are a Towson University student, faculty, or staff member, you can make an appointment to see the exhibit by emailing asianarts at towson.edu. We'll put that in the chat as well. Tune in again tomorrow for Asia North 2020 Art and Music Exchange, Friday, October 16th, also at 7 p.m. The program will feature performances and artist talks by some of the DMV's most creative artists. They include multidisciplinary artist Marlo De Lara, aka Marlo Eggplant, songwriting duo SNRG, Some Never Really Get, visual artist Anderson Woof, and Vidya Vijay Ekshran, and I apologize if I mispronounce that. Learn more and join us through our website and our Facebook page. You can also find a panel discussion, Gardening for the Future, with Fong Fong, Natasha Myers, Nicole DeFio, and Mary Lewis, Tuesday, October 20th at 7 p.m. There'll be a workshop, Pollinator Gardening, Designing Subtle Habitats, with Blue Water Baltimore and Fong Hong, Saturday, November 14th at 11 a.m. We also have a limited number of Korean kite making kits that integrate art, social studies, and engineering. This project has actually been many years in the making. In 2014, we envisioned a physical, multicultural, interdisciplinary, and multi-generational festival highlighting connections across communities and the arts through stories. It just never happened. Then COVID hit. We started to consider how we could continue to connect with our audiences virtually in ways to bring people together through the diverse arts and cultures of the world with an emphasis on Asia. We realized that our stories might work well virtually. Around that time, I offered to volunteer for the AA and CC. Juan and I discussed this project and I was very eager to help. We are filled thrilled to present to 27 storytellers from Baltimore and beyond, Thursdays from October 1st through November 5th, who share their passion, experiences, concerns, and favorite stories with you. You can find details about the whole festival on our website. Please keep in mind that AA and TC is self-support. That means we have to raise all of the money needed for our operations and programs from memberships, grants, sponsorships, and individual donations. Please make a donation tonight and show your support by giving to our website. You can donate from almost any page on the sidebar. There is also a support us page which describes the many ways you can support us. We'll put a link to our donation form in the chat. Before turning the program over to our storytellers, I would like to thank our primary donors who have made this season's programs possible. E. Rhodes and Leona B. from the Carpenter Foundation, Maryland State Arts Council, William G. Baker, Junior Memorial Fund, Central Baltimore Partnership, AA and CC members, TU College of Fine Arts and Communication, Citizens of Baltimore County, 
Roe and Maurice P. Johnson, Legacy Charitable Fund, Yoshinobu and Kathleen Shioda, the Harold J. Kaplan Foundation, TU COFAC Diversity and Inclusion Committee, TU Marketing and Communications, TU BTU Presidential Priority, Robert Mintz and Beth Arman, Anthony and Bonnie Montecalmo, Alexander Nagel and Connie Rosemont and John Greenberg. Thank you to those of you who support us. For those who have not yet contributed, please know that every dollar counts. Please donate $1 or more tonight by visiting our website. Finally, please be sure to submit your feedback about tonight's program via our evaluation form. Your response are crucial for sustaining the AA and CC and reporting to our funders. We'll put that in the chat now and again at the end of the program. The first storyteller I'd like to introduce, introduce to you is Shushmita Mazumdar, who will be performing Sing With Me, Mr. Shuffle. Shushmita is an artist, writer, and studio art instructor for the Smithsonian Associates and founder of Studio Pause, a community space for art and stories in Arlington, Virginia. It is where she works, teaches, and invites every day people to visit, learn, share their art, and celebrate the art and writing of others. She works across stories, book arts, visual art, often mixing it into, uh, sorry, often mixing it into the community to collaborate and discuss and respond to inform her creations. She has been commissioned to create community art projects for Arlington Arts. The National Building Mu uh, Museum and the Friar and Sackler Galleries of Art her art has been on view at the Smithsonian Community Show, the Art League, Arlington Artists Alliance, Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, Virginia Humanities, George Mason University, and at Glen Echoes Park Popcorn Gallery. And without further ado, Sushmita. Hello, everyone. My name is Sushmita Mazumdar, and my story is called Sing to Me, Mr. Shuffle. It's a story about a pandemic time collaboration with roots reaching back five decades and 13,000 miles. It's the story of a girl who grew up in a city called Bombay on the west coast of India. At home, her family spoke Bengali, a language from the east coast of India. In school, she learned three languages. She used the Latin or Roman script to write English and the Devnagari script to write Hindi and Sanskrit. At home, she learned to write another script, Bengali. In art school, she learned about calligraphy or beautiful writing. She learned how the Devnagari script could become art. She also learned Russian and the Cyrillic script. But after she started work, she forgot all about calligraphy. 10 years after college, that girl, now a woman, came to America to marry her sweetheart. As English became her first language and Bengali her second, she lost touch with her other languages. But she still listened to songs from Hindi movies. When she took a painting class in 2011, almost 25 years after art school, she found the Devnagari script and lyrics of her favorite songs appear in her paintings. But then she got busy with opening a community space for art and stories. One day, as she waited to meet a young graffiti artist, she suddenly panicked. Could she still write the Devnagari script? She grabbed a pen, and as the songs played from her phone, she wrote, capturing the beautiful lyrics. Yes, she could still do it. Since then, she has been reconnecting with the script, exploring tools and surfaces learning from masterworks in museums and from her friends who are artists. She found she kept going back to the speed and spontaneity of that moment when she thought all was lost. When she created her first expressive calligraphic artworks using solely the Devnagari script and Hindi movie songs, it was 2018. She realized that her artworks were visuals for emotions buried deep a peek into an identity tangled in a script and a language which represented a huge culture she had torn away from. What am I part of now, she wondered.
One artwork was inspired by the song Safarnama. Oh, mere sare jawabo ka safarnama, meri or se utha teri or ko kadam pehla milenge hum. Oh, all my answers are in the story of this journey. From me will arise the first step towards you. We shall meet. In 2020, the pandemic hit. As an artist whose work was all about a community space, she had to reimagine what to do there when the building was close to the public. But music was still with her, as songs played from her phone always set on shuffle. English, Spanish, Romanian and Brazilian songs mixed in with her favorite Hindi movie songs. She knew that at any point during the day, a song might suddenly speak to her. If she was driving to the studio and a song spoke, she took a photo of the radio display so she could remember the song later. Or she would scribble the lyrics on her hand at a red light. She felt a new project was emerging, a collaboration in an empty studio with an app and an algorithm, a collaboration with the fantastic Mr. Shuffle. He had never failed to sing to her even when everything else was in lockdown and eerily quiet. At the studio, she found blank canvas, grabbed her paints and wrote. She wrote with the back of a brush, with pebbles, or anything else that got her fancy. Mr. Shuffle was full of surprises and her heart and her hands danced to his music. Khamoshiyon mein boli tumhari kuch is tarha gunjti hai. In the silences, your words echo something like this. Kano se mere hote hue wo dil ka pata thundti hai. Passing through my ears, they try to find the way to my heart. She was so drawn to the texture of the artworks when they were wet. She wrote, Wet paint is the right now, this moment, before it dries, hardens to become forever. So what can paint be now? How can I alter, add, mix, blend? Ah, gold. Ooh, my darling spiral. Come, make a puddle. She made the puddle stand up. She watched it become the sun. It shone on the new words written by new poets, words she had never written before. Kafirana sa hai, ishq hai ya kya hai? This feels blasphemous. Is it love or what is it? It was the delicious wetness of the Arabian Sea and the mountains. She had grown up near the famous Juhu beach, seen in so many Hindi movies. It's where she had gone jogging. It's where she had taken relatives who were visiting from out of town. It's where she had enjoyed food-filled evenings with friends and even watched romantic sunsets. It's also where she had witnessed the immersion of Goddess Durga at the end of the annual Durga Puja festival every year. Instead of using a reed pen, nib or brush, she wrote to excavate what got left behind and add in what got layered on. What stayed with me, she wondered. What went into hibernation? What new things did I pick up? Anga sugandhita mana anandhita. Anga sugandhita mana anandhita. Chahu or a rang barsao. Fragrant body and joyful heart. Fragrant body and joyful heart. I wish to shower even more colors. She had endured many blazing hot summers and understood the value of the monsoons. Children ran out of their flats and up to the terrace to jump and dance in the first rains of the year. Schools would close when streets flooded, but they would be out with friends in full rain gear exploring transformed neighborhoods. Of course, all of this was captured in many Hindi movies and songs. Dholwala sipahiya, oho, jo nache dhai dhai, ruke na fir paon paon paon, hava hava. 
The soldier beat the drum, oh ho, she kept on dancing, her legs would not stop, like the wind. When older, she bunked college during the monsoons to walk along Marine Drive with friends, with mad sea waves crashing over the wall and into the street. Years later, from her 11th floor office in Nariman Point, she watched rain race across Back Bay and hit the plate glass windows inches away from her face. The paintings brought out the moments when she connected with a voice, with words, with meaning, with music so evocatively crafted, with imaginings of swirling dance videos and mighty landscapes, and with a multitude of memories, holding them all in the space of this closed studio. Ye zami chup hai, asma chup hai, fir ye dharkan si charasu kya hai. The earth is silent, the sky is silent. Then what's this heartbeat all around me? Oh innocent heart, oh innocent heart, what is your desire? What is it you seek? When she looked at the paintings now, she noticed that unlike in any series before, she had written in two languages, the one she missed, Hindi, and her dominant language, English. She gave credit to an algorithm and thanked Mr. Shuffle for collaborating with her. But there was also a device she was collaborating with. She had to give credit to Miss iPhone 2, the device which was an extension of her fingers. If it hadn't been for it, none of the moments in the story would have been documented. This makes me think how just like memories remain in us for decades, we store hundreds in our devices as well. Maybe the title of the story should have been Sing to me, Mr. Shuffle, and record it all, Miss iPhone. Thank you so much for listening. Shismita, thank you so, so much. That was absolutely amazing. Um, I loved the colors, um, the vibrance, everything of all of these art pieces. And now I'm actually noticing how um, in the, one of the last pictures we saw, it's actually of the wall that's right behind you, is it not? Yeah, that's the wall behind me. That's, I'm in my studio right now, and those are the four paintings. That's so awesome. I just of, you know, the Asian Arts and Culture Center, because if you hadn't put out this call, I would have never documented any of this. I would have no reason to write the story at all. And so, of course, as I wrote this, all those wonderful things that came up, I would have never known if you hadn't put this call out. So thanks a lot for that. No, I thank you so much that you saw our call and felt like, you know, you know, my story is worth telling because truly it is. I was so inspired and so moved by many of the things that you were saying and about your journey. Um, so thank you again so, so much for sharing that. Um, to our viewers, if you do have a question for Shushmita um, concerning her story and her presentation, please do feel free to uh, go ahead and, you know, type it into the chat. Um, but Shushmita, I, have, I definitely have a question. So as an educator, what do you hope to instill in your students who might feel, you know, detached from their respective cultures? Um, so, you know, what I do, uh, a big part of my work is to create a space and an atmosphere when everybody, where everybody's comfortable sharing their story. So to intentionally ask for stories, that is what I practice and I teach people. Because when we do that intentionally and people feel comfortable to share, uh, those kind of spaces are very important in the community. And then when we start sharing, we watch uh, the community change. We can see the people go away changed because they've heard our story. So I think that is a very important thing. And that is the main thing that my work is about. That's awesome. I'm so glad that we're following your footsteps. It wasn't intentional, but I'm glad that we're doing it. Um, it just proves to show, you know, educators definitely, like they know how to reach their students. Um, we do actually have a question from Howard uh, Feinstein. Um, 
who says an enchanting story, Miss Shuffle. Um, it is impressive how you combine various media and let inspiration and memory come out naturally. Oh, I apologize. That is actually not a question. Um, but thank you so much for your comments, Howard. Um, I just so like to know, Howard is a musician, and I wanted to just say to him that I couldn't figure out any way to show clips of the songs because of permissions. So here is a thing about music where you don't hear any music. So. Oh, gotcha. Good to know. Um, I will go ahead and ask you, uh, what was the journey? What has the journey been like reconnecting with the culture you once thought you might have lost? Um, so, you know, it's really interesting because um, there's different things. You don't, I, you don't know when it's going to happen. And so it's really interesting to document and kind of go back to see all the different things that made this happen. And I remember, like, I met a friend, uh, an artist who's a calligrapher, Sugra. And when she started doing calligraphy in her language, she didn't speak much English when I first met her. So I had to start speaking to her in whatever my Hindi was, you know, because she had watched Bollywood movies growing up. And so we started speaking and the songs became our, our conversations. We would use lyrics of songs because she knew them. And oh. so that was like me restarting to speak Hindi again. And then my friend, uh, Mary Louise, who was attending here, uh, you know, had a show of her mark making at my studio. And she, as I saw her hands moving and her demos, I started moving my hands and doing that painting. And then I'm like, well, I know some scripts. Can I start making them into my art? So it's really interesting how everybody and everything kind of shows up. And then of course, people who ask me, oh, what is that song you're playing? What does it mean? You know, then I start translating for my friend Rana, who is also here. She speaks Arabic and I'm translating and she's a poet. I'm translating Bollywood songs into English for her. And then she'll say, oh, that word, we have that word in Arabic. So all these things came together and I started, I realized I'm now, you know, pulling up, pulling up a lot of things that I'd left behind. No, that's awesome. I, I have to tell you, I have to do the same thing whenever I put a Bollywood song on, <laughs> because uh, being in the, especially in the theater department, everybody wants that very, you know, um, theatrical type music to listen to and so there's always translations happening in the background so but I, I love how that was your gateway into kind of reconnecting with your culture I think that's absolutely amazing um Shismita, thank you so 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 much um as you might be able to see in the chats there are so many people who are inspired by your story uh, and by your art so thank you so so much for sharing um I'd like to go ahead and move on to our second storyteller for today um, who is Charlie Jo Rain. Um, Charlie, jo, uh, Charlie Jo is a musician driven by emotion, um, a singer songwriter who strongly, you know, strongly, strongly believes, um, you know, music can change the world. Uh, she hopes to use her music to stand up for those being put down and bless those who others turn their back on. As Charlie Joe describes it, music is like the rain, sometimes angry, sometimes soft, and when it comes, growth is sure to follow. So here is Charlie Joe Rain with her story fortress. I'll turn it over to you. Hey, what's going on? Can I, if everyone can hear me, is it good? Yeah, we're uh, good to awesome. go. Awesome. Yeah. Um, my fan just turned on my apartment. We have no idea how to turn it off. So um, yeah, my song Fortress is a song that I wrote, um, a little bit about me and my story. I am one of the two adopted, uh, black children in an all white family. And I grew up kind of on a farm in Kentucky. And so my entire experience, especially during a lot of the racial tension and, um, divide that's kind of been going on, especially during uh covid when covid hit and then we had a lot of the riots a lot of the marches and it was a time where i had to decide like i love my family and i also i didn't really know a lot about black culture i grew up in a very white community i've always been in the suburbs my whole life um and so for me when i was challenged to write this song at a school i was at a music kind of like music program i was at um, they wanted me to tell my story. And the first song I wrote, 
I was like, okay, it's decent. It's not great. And then right before I had to perform, I scrapped it and wrote a brand new song <laughs> in like 10 minutes. And oh I, yeah, because it was just, I wanted something that conveyed everything. And for me, my, my song kind of speaks for itself. So I'm not going to go like super deep into my whole life. And if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I can answer. I'm very open about kind of what it was like growing up. Um, and like even some of the conversations I had with my family, but I wanted a song that conveyed everything that I was feeling from, we call like the token black child. And so for me, this was kind of fortress was a way of um, expressing all of that. And so I really hope you all like it. Uh, just a little fun fact about this song. It got me three no's on American Idol. So <laughs> gotta love it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Katy Perry did not like it, <laughs> but hopefully you do. So it's, uh, yeah, Fortress. up against me and I feel like I can't move when the world tries to hold me down and drown me and I'm screaming out where are you you say with your strength can overcome anything yeah, why do I feel so weak? Cause you say you'll protect me, that I'm safe. Yet why do I still feel attacked by the enemy? No fortress, refuge, you see you got me, but do I got you? Question in this life you've given me. Get away, are you? Fortress, refuge, you see, you got me, but do I got you? Question in this life you've given me. Where are you? I don't know what it's like to have a split personality, but I know what it's like to be locked up on my mentality. Motions holding a gun cocks back up against my skull. Only praying once again that my mind can take control. You know it's easy. Telling broken people sometimes they need to the trust, but do you understand just what you ask of us? Laying down every wall we spend years building up with no security blanket. I'm coming out exposed and naked. My wounds are in the open. Who can I really trust? You say leaning into you, my eyes will open up, but the pain's been a lot. Some days I feel like I can't make it. I try to swallow pills, I want a piece. You said be patient, I'm not complaining, no. You know, cause life has never been easy. I've been backstabbed and assaulted and it's changed the way that I see things. You know, people look at me, tell me, girl, you've had a good life. Adoption is a benefit, so slacking you ungrateful child, but you know what it's like? Explain to every kid. Yeah, I don't fit in. Me and my family, we all look different. I make jokes about those Oreos. I mean, everyone calls me white. Is it wrong that my linguistics don't match up to the ones I look like? You know, this is just a glimpse to life that I've had. No specifics. I mean, God, where were you and all of that? For every time I cried out to you, I felt abandoned and dirty like some clothes thrown down the laundry chute. You no, know, Psalms 46 says, Do you always have my back? For the weight of my baggage is constantly holding me back. What words do you have for your servant on the knees? I'm begging you, Lord, come now and speak to me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That was absolutely beautiful. I have no idea Thank why you. you got three no's. Yeah. Katie Perry, <laughs> we need to have a talk. <laughs> Yeah, I know. My my nieces and nephew like argue with them for a hot sec. So, 
Yeah. Good for them for standing up for you. Yeah. Because no, that was awesome. I, I loved how, you know, um, you know, it had a really big impact. Like everything that you're feeling, I could feel through that song. There was nothing hidden. Um, Thank you. Thank I think you. it's not just about like, you know, yes, you want to appeal to the masses, but you also want to share your story, the thing that's really makes you unique, the things that really, because somebody out there will connect with that. Um, so no, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, and I can already see in the chats, people are commenting about how much <laughs> they loved it. Um, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much. And for sure, um, again, if you guys have any questions for Charlie Joe, just go ahead and type them in the chat um, and we'll try to get through them. But um, what's the biggest thing that you hope your audience will take away from this story? Like, it's so powerful. It's such a powerful piece. And you said so many different things. Um, you touched so many different points. But what's like, what's the thing that you really hope the audience is going to hit the audience the most? I think one thing that I really want the audience to take apart from or take away from Fortress is the fact that we all go through a lot of things and no matter how dark or how um, I would say hard it gets, that doesn't mean that you can't rise above it and you can't like come out of it. I think that that is something that a lot of people, um, when they hear my story, cause I've like, everyone kind of has that one moment that kind of took them down and they've experienced hardship in that area and not to put anyone's like pain or suffering down at all. Like I've, I just feel like for my story, I've had a kind of like a toe into everything that could pretty much go wrong. Um, and I want people to realize that one, like you're not alone and that darkness, you're not alone. There's people that I may not understand fully what you're going through. I know a piece of it. And so for me, like there's hope on the other side. And so this, this song was a song that I wanted people to realize, like, like it's one, it's okay to have questions. It's okay to doubt, but you're going to make it. Like, I believe in you and there's people that love you and there's people that struggle alongside of you that you're not alone and you're going to make it out of it. So. That's yeah. awesome. And I do think that you actually really did convey that in your song. So oh, thank, um, you. thank you. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, so who do you feel in your life has like really been your, like your supporter and like, you know, really been there for you and encouraged your music and your storytelling? I think the one person that encouraged me to start telling my story was my older brother. Um, he was the person that would sit me down when I was in those hard times. And he would tell me that like, something's coming, like something's always coming. Like, don't give up, don't quit, be authentic because your story can reach somebody. And so like, for me, when he kept telling me those things, I wanted like a lot of people say they want to play music on like the biggest stages or whatever, because they want to be famous. I want to play music on the biggest stages so that my music can reach somebody in a dark time and they can hear it and be like, oh crap, she understands. And so like when I was going through those moments, my brother would sit there and he'd be like, you're not alone. Some days he would just cry with me, which was what people don't realize also is it's good to have those friends that want to try and lift you up and, um, kind of help you out of that and pump you up but also it's okay to just sit in those moments with your friends and just cry with them like it's okay to do that and that was a thing that my brother did and he would always encourage me to channel it through my music just to say what I want to say just get it out and I can never talk but when I have my guitar like it just wouldn't stop and so I was like well I might as well just give it a try and he's been there with me ever since he was the first person when I came out of American Idol and like first person I called and like he was everything to me so oh, that's so so awesome I having two brothers myself I totally understand how the kind of connection that you have with your friends it's always awesome and it's amazing but that mm -hmm. that connection that you have with your siblings it's out of this world it's out of the charts yeah. they're not comparable at all so I'm 
I don't know. It's so beautiful. I'm getting so teary eyed listening to you guys talking about it. No, I I honestly like it's such a beautiful relationship that you and your brother have. Um, And so thank you for sharing that. I hope he's watching. I don't know if he is, but hopefully he is. No, I didn't invite him. Like I love my brother, but every time I invite him to Zooms, he like never mutes himself. And so like whatever we're in, like I invite him to like this concert thing or um, and he was like discussing cooking techniques while like these people were trying to sing and I'm like texting him like <laughs> mute yourself please oh um gosh. but like yeah he he does come to a lot of my shows though and my parents also um like record a lot of stuff and share it because we have a family group chat because uh, we're those people <laughs> oh that's awesome um yeah Okay, so again, um, you know, everybody in the chat or everybody watching, you can put a question in the chat if you have it. Uh, we'll be happy to get to it. Um, but is there someone that, like, aside from your brother, like somebody external some, um, who's, like, really been your, who you saw and, like, was like, oh, this person's doing this and I want to try this, like, when it comes to your, like, storytelling or, you know, somebody else that you really admire um, who was, you know, expressing themselves in a way that kind of encouraged you to do the same? Yeah, um, one of my, like, songwriting models or, like, role models that I look up to, um, a lot of people judge me, but Justin Bieber is, like, uh, (laughs) he, I know a lot of people don't, like, Justin Bieber and Shawn Mendes and Demi Lovato actually recently is somebody that I really, really looked up to in terms of songwriting and storytelling. Uh, Demi Lovato especially, because every one of her songs is so honest as of like the last couple of years when I seriously took song, like when I started taking songwriting seriously and she talked about everything. Like there was not, like, it's not just go happy stuff. She's like, you know what? I'm struggling right now with my addiction. I need a song. Like, I'm sorry guys, I'm struggling with an eating disorder. And like, you wouldn't know that about me, but I'm just going to pour it all out there. And every time I hear one of her songs, I cry, I cry <laughs> because it just hits a string in my heart that's like, crap, somebody else gets it. And it, I just like, if I could follow in her footsteps one day, like that would be amazing, absolutely amazing. That's awesome. And I promise I'm not judging you because I 100% agree with you. So no judgment on this side. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) It took me like probably six years to admit I was a believer. Like, (laughs) okay. (laughs) When it comes to Demi, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. Yes. (laughs) No, no, no. I'm joking. Amazing. She was amazing. Yeah. No, but honestly, no judgments. Um, so we do have a question in the chat where okay. uh, we have Grace Doyle. She's asking, where are you lo- located um, and where do you perform typically? Because it would be great to support you and your music if possible. Yeah, so I am located in Towson right now. Um, I'm probably going to be in Baltimore, Baltimore for probably the next two years or two and a half years. And I do a lot of, um, I've been doing a lot of Zoom shows lately, but we're looking at booking the next, like I have about three restaurants lined up. And so um, if you want to follow that, I think I'm tagged in one of the Instagram posts and I put all that information on Instagram and Facebook. If you want to follow along, you're more than welcome to. I'd love to see you. And yeah. Like, if you go perform. to the Asian Arts and Culture Center Instagram, our latest post, yes, she's correct. She is tagged in that. So yeah. you can follow us and then click her name and then go follow her. Follow us both. Yeah. <laughs> Rack exactly. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, Charlie Joe, thank you so so much for sharing your story. I hope yeah. that we get to work together again in the future because it has been an awesome experience, especially today. Yeah, um thank you. thank you once again. Um if anybody has, like you get you guys can always reach out to Charlie Joe again on yeah, our Instagram. Like yes, I'd or even here in the chat, like um I'm, and I'm, I'm sure like well, she'll be able to type up a response in the yeah. chat so but Charlie mm-hmm. thank you again so much it's my pleasure thanks for having me again guys I appreciate it yeah, of course um, I'd like to go ahead and move on to our third performer for today um, Suk Young Park um, in 1982 Suk Young established an arts and crafts studio in South Korea In 2011, she immigrated to the U.S. to study as a community college student at Warwick Community College and obtained an associate's degree. At the University of Maryland College Park, she attained academic harmonies for three semesters. 
After graduation in May 2016, she joined the Han Mi Artist Association, also known as the Korean American Artists Association. She attended several regional exhib exhibitions and selected juries exhibitions. This year, Sukyung joined the Washington Sculptor Group and was accepted into Towson University MFA program. Go Tigers! So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sukyung Park and Sukyung's art. When I lived in South Korea, I run art and craft studio named Serong. The studio specialized in decoupage and stained glass. In 2011, my family and I moved to the United States. I wasn't familiar with the new society. Soon after, I decided to take the college test to adopt the new society. I chose fine art to run various genres. This year, I challenged once again, and now I am studying sculpture in MFA program. February 9, 2011 was an ordinary unchanging season, but it was really different from usual. The day after leaving Korea, my family arrived in the United States. Our tensions and anxieties about the different surroundings and the uncertain future were like the frozen February weather. To express their feeling, a mixture of jets, stone powder, and acrylic are layered and applied on the canvas to depict it as if it was snowy and cold. I couldn't understand some explanation well, but for the first time in my life, I took a sculpture class. During the class, I was taking a break in the car for a while, but the wind blew so hard, my car was shaking. Suddenly, one idea came up to my heart at that time in various ways. Me and my family were living in such strong wind, so this thing touched me. In order to compensate for the shortcomings of thin plywood, it took a lot of time to bend and harden after layering with glue. In the process of making this, it took more patience and concentration than any other works. But in the end, it was completed. With this work, I opened my eyes to the concept of sculpture. Sit in the Night is based on the theme of the early evening when it rains. To express this feeling, the part that does not touch the oil paint after applying sparse oil paint using a thick glue, acrylic ink naturally shifts into the early evening light, as if it was a rainy day. It expresses a beautiful night, her neighbor in Seoul, South Korea, that was kept in my heart. As such, this work has been recreated in various colors as a motif of past memories and experiences. For this work, I chose the paper because paper is weak in water but does not disappear, giving a sense of existence that can remain in some form. To compensate for the weakness of the paper, it was folded into several layers and connected to each other to express its solidity and strength. Also, the overlapping shapes and lines were inspired by Korean traditional loop. This type of loop are still preserved on traditional Hanok loop in urban and rural areas. I chose the avian tide as the theme to express the conflict of mind. I always face just like the event tide of breathing and change the sea. I did this in hopes of myself moving forward in that change to better convey this breathing feeling. The dark blue was painted as a base and then gradually finished with light blue and white. Also in order to express the fragment of life as works, many papers were folded and produced. Most of my work contains blue reminiscent of the sea. For me, the meaning of blue is that it has a strong will, a spirit of challenge, a cold feeling, and the ability to flow freely. When I was in my 20s, I often traveled to the sea if I had time. I used to dream of many thoughts and features. As I looked endlessly at the open sea, 
then memories and reflections still exist in my heart. Like this, I want to share my feelings with the audience who understand the intentions of my artwork, using it as a tool for conversation. Overall, my point of view captures a moment of nature and everyday life. As always, my works are ways to bring beautiful memories to life challenge and hope, expressing these emotions in color and form. Thank you for hearing my story. Thank you so, so much, Sukyung. That was absolutely beautiful. Um, I was taking a look at your artwork a little earlier as well, and it's absolutely stunning. Um, I have absolutely loved the sculptures that you have done um, thus far. And again, thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I noticed that you no use um, uh, like many different materials in your artwork. What has been your favorite material to work with so far? Ah, uh, this time is uh, yeah, my favorite is uh, yeah, paper. <laughs> is paper? Yes, of course. Um, what about paper kind of really makes it like your favorite? But paper is uh, always is uh, a little uh, uh, changing the smooth and uh, very soft, and uh, some color is uh, always uh, yeah quickly observed. So yeah, that one. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and again, everybody uh, who is listening in, um, if you do have any questions for Sip Young, please just go ahead and put them in the chat um, and we will hopefully get to them. Um, what advice would you, Sip Young, give to other artists who have also immigrated to another country and are also kind of having a hard time finding their place and adjusting? Excuse me. Sorry, here, I, uh, I'll try to be a little clear. So in the same way that you came to the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. and you had some difficulty in the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. finding your place and, um, you know, really figuring out, you know, you know, what to do when you got here. So if somebody else immigrated here, another artist immigrated here and experienced the same thing you did, what advice would you give them? No, 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 no advice. Just yeah, my family means just came here. No relationship here. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody else came here, what what advice would you give them? No, no, no advice. Just no advice. I, yeah, no advice. Yeah. I just <laughs> thought. I just deeply thought. How how can I yeah adapt to this society? Everything is different. Everything is uh, difficult to understand, even educational system, also bank account, even gas station, everything is different. So yeah, I deeply thought, how can I, how can I do that? So uh, one day yeah, I thought, okay, I uh, take a test, college test. Yes, but I got the college test so yeah, <laughs> I passed the Kali test by a miracle, just a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> or, so I, I guess like it's really just important to kind of find, you know, whatever you're passionate about uh -uh. before you might come here, make sure you stick to that, make sure you find your niche. It's mm -hmm. a, like, that's important to stick with and it'll, it'll help you adapt and adjust as well. And as well as help you kind of you know, share your story and share your culture with people here who might not be as knowledgeable about it. Mm -mm. Awesome. Um, so we have a question from um, Shanti, um, who is asking, what kind of paper do you use? I right now, I use just printing paper, uh, but I considering uh, about the traditional paper later. But right now, my paper sculpture is just a printing paper. Right now, yeah. Later, later, yeah, yeah. I will create the the uh, with traditional paper, maybe. Yes. <laughs> gotcha. Um, we also have a, a question from Grace, who's asking, um, do you um do you find you use techniques from your time with the craft school now with your art? So, do you use the techniques that you used in Korea in your art now? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So what are those techniques? My tech techniques? 
the, the techniques that you used in Korea that you still use now? Yeah, still using now, yeah. But what, what are your art techniques for that? Ah, uh, just, ah, uh, uh, the technique? Just, yeah. uh, just technique is, yeah, I don't know the technique is, just I feeling, so my feeling something new, and yeah, I just, uh, uh, what kind of technique, many technique. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of them. <laughs> lots of technique, more lots too, of too many to name, and that's okay. Yes, yes too many thoughts in my yeah, heart, yes, uh, yeah. yeah. No, but that's awesome that you're, you are still using the techniques that you learned so long ago from your, um, from Korea. Like, that's absolutely amazing. Um, and then, you know, um, thank you so much, Sukyung. Um, it's been so amazing to have you. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. I absolutely love your sculptures, um, paper and all. Um, and I think they have so, such a heavy meaning behind them. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sukhi. <Sophia. laughs> um, I'd like to go ahead and move on to our last storyteller for today. I know we're, it's, we're so close, but don't worry, there's always more. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Henry Chen. Uh, Henry came to the U.S. in 1947 with his parents. His early schooling took place in the Upper Darbury PA School District. He attended high school at Weston School from 1955 to 1958. He completed his B.A. in 1963 in biochemical science from Harvard College, his M.A. in 1969 in biophysics at John Hopkins University, and his Ph.D. in 1969 in experimental nuclear physics um, at UMCP. Henry was a full-time faculty member at Towson University, again, go Tigers, from 1965 to 2009, uh, practicing um, music since 1964. He has played the piano and organ in churches and has been doing orchestral conducting since 1980 and onward. Um, and without further ado, Henry, I'd like to give it on to you. Thank you all for staying for the final story when you could be pre preparing for something else. As you know, professors love to talk, but generally about their academic subjects, not about themselves. I finally decided to take this opportunity because at age 80, I may be the oldest Asian American immigrant I know. And I've spent over 73 years in the US. I started reading newspapers in 1950. So I followed our national US scene for over 70 years. And these are strange times indeed. Recently, life has become especially touchy for Chinese Americans or anyone who might be thought of as Chinese. Now, I know that immigrant experience today, in fact, life in general, is very different from what I experienced in the late 40s and 50s. Nevertheless, I hope some of my very personal story will not only be of interest to you, whatever your ancestry, but will also contribute in some small way to our ongoing national discussion. Before going further, I'd like to express thanks okay, to the Asian Arts and Culture Center, especially to Joanna and Narissa for um, their kindness and patience in guiding Linda and me through this process. If it's a truism that it takes a village to raise a child, then it's certainly more true that it takes many villages to properly raise an old man. That includes neighborhoods, schools, universities, and so on. And I will give thanks to the literally thousands in all these villages to which I have belonged, who have touched my life, and especially to some true saints in these villages. Finally, I want to thank my daughter, Stephanie, whose first village was Towson University's Lida Lee Tall. She has grown into a lovely, she has grown into a lovely, kind, interesting, talented, and capable woman and to my dear partner and wife of over 32 years, Linda, one of whose villages was also my beloved Towson University. Nothing, including this presentation, would be possible without her. I'm gonna follow basically the chronological path, but we'll take side trips every now and then, and I'll close if time permits 
with some musings. In the early summer of 1947, my parents, my sister Kitty, my cousin Corbin, whom I will show later, uh, and I, at seven years old, embarked from Shanghai, China to the US. The ship, a troop transport designated the SS Gordon, here shown in 1987, had been used by the Allies during World War II, which had ended almost exactly two years before. Obviously, there are no big state rooms there, no big windows. Somewhere on one of these decks here were these huge rooms with rows upon rows upon rows of beds. My mother had us three children with her in the women's section. My father was somewhere else in the ship. We met for meals, but I remember American food at that time seemed so different from Chinese. Soon we landed in San Francisco and were headed for Washington, DC. It would cost in today's dollars, $5,000 a person to fly so we took the week-long train trip to DC. We settled in Philadelphia, where my father start, would start teaching that fall at the University of Pennsylvania. Thus started my life in the US. Ah, here is auntie, uncle, Corbin, our family, and an elder uh, uncle. We settled in Philadelphia. Thus started my life in the US. We were initially here as guest aliens on a two year guest visa. It turns out it would be almost another 70 years before I would again set foot on Chinese soil, this time as a tourist and with Linda. That we arrived at all in the United States and that I'm alive today is improbable enough so that I have to think of it as a blessing. I was born in March of 1940 in Shanghai, which at that time had been under Japanese occupation for almost three years. We think of World War, World War II as having started after the attack on our fleet at Pearl Harbor in 1941, but actually there had been extensive war in East Asia since 1931. The Republic of China was established in 1912 after the fall of China's last imperial dynasty. Okay. And uh, in 1931, Japan occupied Manchuria up in here. Okay. And in August of 1937, war broke out in full. Japanese forces quickly captured Shanghai, here, okay. then Beijing, then Nanjing, then the, cap the capital of China in a notoriously horrific campaign. But Japan was unable to extend occupation over all of China because of its size. Okay. Oh dear, sorry. Here's a map again. And uh, The problems of labeling maps for China involves a, complete, a complex process of romanization. Okay. Terribly interesting, but I don't have time. the time. What I'll try to do is to use at least two names for the city so you can identify, but I'm not going to be consistent. If you know Chinese, my Pudonghua may not be the same as yours. So now, here is Taiwan, okay? Here is Shanghai, where we left. Beijing, up in, Beijing is here. Nanjing here. Okay. My mother's hometown of Fuzhou is there. My father's is nearby. Okay. The area of this country is about the same as the area of the United States, and the Japanese could only occupy the coast. Here's sort of a picture of how much the Japanese occupied in the furthest extent, okay? All of Korea, Manchuria, parts of China. This is in what used to be called Indochina and Burma and all these islands here, okay? 
Many Chinese institutions, including the whole Chinese government, fled then inland. Okay. My mother and father. Dear, dear, dear. My m m mother and father uh, became uh, had met at a Western, uh, well, at Fujing Christian University. It had moved inland. But my father became, when my mother became pregnant with me, they decided she should go back to Shanghai because it always had a large international community and Western medical care. As planned, my father returned to Shanghai for my birth. But shortly thereafter, the Japanese cut the roads to the interior. Thus, Shanghai became our home for the first five, for the five years until the war's end. Though I never thought about it until a few weeks ago, we survived without dad's teaching job only because he was from what is known as the scholar landowning class. So there were reserve funds available. My memories of the war years are from all from the end. One very vivid one is of my parents, me, my sister and me on the porch of our fifth floor apartment, along with a family from the third floor. We are looking at the glow from fires in the distance, the result of allies bombing Japanese installations. On the street below are men running around with automatic pistols with long ammunition clips. And I'm telling the boy from the third floor that if we were being shot at, it would be safer to be on the fifth floor than the third floor because the bullets had further to go. I was already thinking about what physicists might call the motion of a projectile under the influence of air friction and gravity. Another memory very poignant is of being told my, by my parents of the death of President Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt and of this photo that had been in the Chinese press. With tears streaming down his face, he's singing, gone home as the funeral trains pass by. A third memory from the world war's end, much more stark, a naked corpse floating face down in a canal in my mother's city of Fuzhou. Our immediate family of four has survived the war intact, partly because of my parents' class status, but hundreds of millions were not born so fortunate. And the estimate of total Chinese deaths is 20 million. On August 6th, the US dropped the first atom bomb on Hiroshima. Three days later, the second. In September 2nd, Japan formally signed papers of surrender. For much of the earth, the bloodiest war in history was more or less over. For some places though, especially China, World War II merely entered another phase. The Chinese resistance against the Japanese was actually carried out by two groups, the nationalists led by a man I know as Chiang Kai-shek and the communists led by a man I know as Mao Zedong. With the Chinese surrender, these two groups now fought for control of uh, China. The nationalists were not, uh, notoriously corrupt and when they retreated to Taiwan here in 1949, their treatment of the native Taiwanese who were not Chinese was atrocious. The communists were totalitarian and eventually killed millions of their own. So my father took a job at the University of Xiamen, a moy off the coast here. Uh, here's, uh, I'm gonna say Formosa, Taiwan, and here, then closer in here, is Shaman. He was a semi-tropical paradise for me. My father always had a hard time holding his tongue when he felt was something uh, when he felt something was wrong, a trait I inherited for better or worse. Both po political factions objectionable to him, so he decided to teach for a few years at the University of Pennsylvania 
where he had gotten his PhD in the early 30s. The letter verifying his employment was supposed to come to the closest U.S. consulate on the mainland over here. But something was wrong. Uh, but the daily visits there for weeks were in vain. Finally, he gave up and started back to the island. And as he tells the story at the rails, railway station, by chance he ran into an acquaintance who said, I just left the US consulate and uh, a letter just arrived for you. And so my father went back to the consulate. So a matter of seconds, perhaps, and I wouldn't have never left China. Given my social class, I almost surely would have been sent to the countryside for re-education during China's great leap forward. Being sickly and severely asthmatic then, my chances for survival would have been low. In Chinese and academic families, learning in general was of prime importance, and I was pushed a lot. By the time we arrived in the US, I could do long division and speak three dialects and read and write, but only Chinese, no English. Then something miraculous. In the US, ecology, my asthma was no longer a problem. I could actually go to school with other children, not only to run and laugh, but also to learn English naturally. My first two years of school experience were, I thought, quite mundane. I learned the usual, taking a school bus, buying lunch at the corner store for five cents, and not chasing a cute girl around the playground and try to kiss her. English initially may have been difficult, but at that age, one learns easily, especially if parents know it. By the time we moved in 1949 to our first house in Drexel Hill, I had skipped a grade and I was caught up. Around then, I encountered my first confusion with race. At a bathroom stop on a car trip south, I was stopped by a sign similar to this. I knew I wasn't white, but I wasn't sure whether I was colored enough to use the other. I needed my father to tell me that for the purposes of racial segregation in the US, I was white enough. A chain of events made it less important to maintain my Chinese. We went from being visiting aliens to full-fledged immigrants. Now, the US has a long history of excluding certain nationalities. However, the only federal US legislation ever to exclude specifically a particular nationality was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Especially in China, Chinese faced both widespread and physical violence and discrimination for the century before we came. By 1943, China and the US were now allies, so the prohibition was lifted. The yearly quota for Chinese was set very generously. First number is a one. Second number is a zero. The third number is a five. What do you think the fourth number is? Nothing. There was no fourth number. Now, given the huge number of Chinese in line, what was the chance that our family of four would ever be among these 105 for the year? The natural flippant answer, to use a once popular phrase, is of course a Chinaman's chance, right? Okay, back to seriousness. But my father, being a physics professor, was considered to be a desirable alien, okay? Sort of like these. And so one day, one day in June of 1948, we took a car trip to Buffalo, New York. The next day we drove to Niagara Falls. Okay? We walked across the Rainbow Bridge to the Canadian side, became Canadian citizens, walked back to the American side, and were now readmitted 
as immigrants from Canada. So the workaround for us, for the quota, was literally this walk around. This is today's rather sad view of where I spent six happy informative years, grade four through nine. Okay? But it was beautiful then. And we had neighbors on each side that were very friendly and accepting. In this overview, for uh, our house is, for heaven's sakes, here, here. And within four minutes walking was an elementary school, okay, was the station that would take me to piano lessons and to junior high, a, the Baptist church, and over here, about 180 houses and row, uh, row houses that gave us a veritable orgy of candy during Halloween. Okay. Now, the children's life in, 80, in the early 50s was very much like what you would see from an old black and white TV program in post-war years, like Leave it to Beaver. Okay. All these things were in fact true. Okay. And I learned to ride a bike, became a paper boy, mowed lawns and shoveled snow to earn money to su supplement my allowance. I played at schoolyard with my friend and Johnny Rischel, a lifelong friend, he and his parents took me under wing. They introduced me to TV, one of the one this big, eight by 10. And they took me to Boy Scouts. The knots I learned to tie have been incredibly useful in life. That was also where I met for the first time boys that smoked, cursed, and told dirty jokes. And that too was a valuable part of my education. At that time, I was completely oblivious to what the transition to the US meant for my parents. But it must have been extremely difficult. In China, my father's learning gave him the big highest status in society. And though people here were impressed by his being a Dr. Chen, money now seemed a more important criterion, and he earned barely more than the people who collected the trash. Mother, who never had to cook, now in a foreign land without servants, measured herself by how many different kinds of cookies she would bake for Christmas. For me, there was always the cloud of a very occasional racial taunt. The standard one was, Ching Ching Chinaman sitting on a fence trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Yeah. Evidently, there's a long history, some of which I've sketched out here, associated with this very similar ditty. A few observations. Rather than real animo racial animosity, I thought it was more like an obese child being picked on and called fatty. Okay, my race is the most obvious and convenient identifier. Not that it didn't hurt, but I never got hit by this woman here in Korea, from Korea in 1906, where the girl surrounded her and hit her as they sang Ching Ching Chinaman sitting on a fence. Okay. Secondly, if you look at this thing, the ditty from a purely rational point of view, okay, what is more American than making lots of money. Third, in a joke I can't tell here, what was supposed to be stupidity on the part of a Chinese man was in fact a tremendous generosity in sharing his considerable endowment. Now, some of that hatred is everywhere today in the US. About three years ago, a little misunderstanding in a parking lot let a woman in maybe her late 20s to put down her window and say, why don't you go back to China? Now that happened to me, that hadn't happened to me in about 35 years. So it really caught me by surprise. One foundational change for me was that I got a new piano teacher, Elijah Yardumian. His methods were unusual, but I made tremendous progress in technique. With him also started my lifelong interest in 
surnames, the origin of surnames, and his was Armenian. Getting to Elijah's studio involved two car rides with a transfer at an open air terminal. It's a sign of oh, a 50 minute round trip. It's a sign of the 1950s that even rather careful parents like mine would, al would allow a six year old to do this on his own. In winter, it got really cold, but the street carmen at the terminal would invite me to in to wait with them in the little shack where they warmed up. Most of them seemed to be Irish. And so soon I was given the honorable honor, uh, surname O'Chen. Okay. Yardumian, named after a prophet, is one of my personal saints. I'm eternally grateful. Okay. Drexel Hill Baptist was also foundational for me. My parents were nominally Christian, but now my sister and I went to Sunday school and church. I started playing hymns every Sunday. We joined the choir. The church's musical director was an amazing phenomenon. She was thin as a rail, smoked like a chimney, and would sometimes swear and yell at the senior choir. Things I learned from her, I still use for my own choirs. By age 15, I drifted away. Some of the obvious irrationalities bothered me. Nevertheless, I fondly remember the large core of good people there, including a family of the minister, Carl Dawkins. When the first African-American family moved into nearby Drexel Brook, one of the earliest planned communities of the 50s, he was among a group of ministers who openly supported the presence of that family. Unfortunately, the congregation wasn't ready to follow his truly Christian example. And he was ultimately driven out and spent some time in a mental hospital. What has remained with me are the fundamental precepts and constant exposure to Christian teaching as contained in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Mercy, compassion, empathy, humility, frugality, charity. You can see in this picture of the Baptist choir, there are lots of children. Okay. Here I am, here is my sister. Okay. And many of these children you see are in this picture of the elementary school. Here is Johnny Mitchell, uh, Richel, Johnny Richel, my lifelong friend. I hoped he would hear, but I don't think he is. Amazingly, I rem remember most of the names after 65 years. You see that I'm the only person of color, but a list of their surnames would make clear the great diversity of their backgrounds. I can go through and look at them. And I don't remember any hint of racial discrimination from classmates. Okay? Uh, Upper Darby Junior High was socially a continuation of elementary school, though much larger. There were three Chinese boys, otherwise white students, in a school of about 1,200, but again, great diversity among the whites. As elementary school, there was essentially no racial taunting from fellow students, and the faculty members treated me very well. Academically great and important formative years. Highlights, all students took a civics course in grade eight that gave me a, strained found, a strong foundation for evaluating our nation today. How different our nation might be if each person has such a course with the excellent teacher I had. Secondly, all college bound students took Latin in ninth grade, but my father wanted me to have German. The course went the first time in decades, and I'm eternally grateful for all the worlds in which Germans, uh, German led me. The next four years of my life at Westtown School, Quaker Quad boarding school near Philly, and the fourth a year in Germany as an exchange student were the happiest of my life. Though formerly the religious society of friends, they were called Quakers because the early ones were said to quake with emotion. Their central tenet that there is that of God in every man, and here man includes women, meant that each human was to be treated equally. At Westtown, by far the most important influences were 
faculty and staff, some of whom lived with us on the dormitory. They were well-educated, intelligent, gentle, funny, soft-spoken, supportive. Not all were Quakers, but all exemplified the Quaker beliefs. The tradition of being living testaments to one's belief has had a strong influence on me. It is not enough to try to support the good. One must also speak out and actively work against the wrong. It is not enough to be not racist. One has to be actively anti-racist. Our class of 58 are constantly in touch. Many of them are here, love to you all. This picture shows Eki Bart, the cello playing exchange student from Germany with whom I did chamber music. After graduating from West Town, I spent an absolutely marvelous year as an exchange student living with him and his family. My life has been incredibly enriched by exposure to all that he gave me. With Eki, I gained also a German family and a bunch of German classmates. Germans have done extremely well in dealing with its Nazi past. It's something we in the US have yet to do with our slavery past. Freshman year in college was a shocker. I missed my life in Germany. Having to study really hard was depressing. One thing that kept life good was the freshman glee club. Another was a German club of which I became president during my later years. The only Chinese American I knew, US born Ed Sun, I actually met through the German club. The entering class of 1959, about 1200 men and 300 women had 18 then called Negroes, a big increase from the past, and about eight Asians, including one Japanese and one Indian. I never experienced any racial incidents there, perhaps because there were so few of us. The other people of color may have had different experiences, but the late 1950s was a more genteel time. One pivotal event, the summer after freshman year, I met this German Jewish scientist, uh, Otto Löwe, here shown many years before I met him when he was 87 and now infirm. By happenstance, his German living nurse heard me speaking German and I was immediately corralled to uh, sit with him one afternoon a week while she had some much needed downtime. Speaking English was much too tiring for him. He took me, but he took me under wing. Okay? Who would hire a Chinese to teach German, he would say. Now, I was, was not mature enough to see the wisdom of that. But then he used to say, if you want to be broadly educated as I am, my first two years as a med student was spent in Italy studying art history, you must major in science. A scientist can be active and confident in something in humanities, but it's almost impossible the other way around. And that was compelling because he knew I treasured being broadly educated. So I switched from German back to science, which I had, had been all, always my forte anyway. As a biochem major, I got lackluster grades, though I learned quite a bit. To Uncle Otto, the angel in my village of Woods Hole, I earned the whole of my marvelous subsequent life as a scientist and teacher. Going to graduate school in Baltimore was also by happenstance, okay? I applied to two schools and only got into Hopkins. I met some marvelous people there, one of whom, Ed Latman, has been my friend ever since. Hi, Eddie, I see you. My performance as a grad student, though, was worse than lackluster. I flunked out, an unthinkably shameful and horrible thing for any Chinese, especially the son of a professor. It turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me. In the middle of August, with research winding down at Hopkins, I started job hunting. I ended up with a one-year temp appointment here at Towson. Okay? And uh, I liked it. They liked me. And I in 2009, I retired after 44 years from a department that I truly love in an institution a village that I will always call my home. Okay. 
when I decided to go back to graduate school to get a doctorate, okay, uh, the department gave me a three-year leave of absence, an almost unheard of generosity. At College Park, I had a great teacher who turned out also to be incredibly generous, giving me a research assistantship in his group so I could be back in grad school without tremendous financial hardship. Linda and I still keep in touch with him, drink old Bordeaux wines together. He is another angel in my life. Though I'm no longer on, on campus, I keep track. It seems as though our President Chasso is working hard to fix the racial residue of African slavery. Were that our nation was so successful. It's often said in this time of strife that we should treat each other better because we're all the same. I think it's dangerous to be inexact about language because words do matter. We homo sapiens think with words. No, we're not all the same. Just look at the screens here. The really correct statement is unfortunately both technical and biological. Each individual shares 99.9% .9 genetic makeup with any other individual. I don't think that makes the races very happy. Whereas we share only 96% with any chimpanzee. I'm not sure that makes any human happy. And I realize it's pretty cumbersome to say and think things like that. But there is a very strong, because there's a very strong anti-science sentiment in this country, okay? something that didn't exist when I was a kid. But one could say something less scientific sounding like, we are much more similar than different, or most of us, psychopaths accepted, are the same when it, where it counts, with an innate ability to show the qualities of compassion, kindness, and hope to treat others as you would want to be treated. Thank you. Sorry, I ran over. Not a problem, um, Henry. Thank you that so much. Awesome. Your your journey was absolutely, um, you know, I don't have words for it, to be honest. It's, um, it's amazing how every single person finds their way, has found their way here, but the, the journey is like every single one is absolutely different. Nobody's journey has been the same. And if we only took the time to really sit down and listen to one another, we'd really understand how, as you said, we, we are all different, but we do have our similarities, which is exactly what we have been trying to emphasize um, with the Our Stories Virtual Festival. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Um, once again, everyone who's listening, if you do have a question for Henry, please do not hesitate to put it in the chat. Um, Henry, I do have a question for you. Um, what was the most difficult part, you would say, of immigrating um, to the U.S.? Was it, was it the process? Was it leaving loved ones behind? Or was it something else? It's too long ago for me to know. You know it's just... I'm 80 years old. You know, what was most? <laughs> I mean, life has been so good for me. That there's a tendency to forget what was hard, right? But uh, I mean, I do know that any racial problems I had is nothing compared to what African Americans go through. And okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. And other groups. And other groups. Yes. I mean. I should have had a little talk with my daughter about what prejudice she might encounter. The thing is, she went to Lila Lee Tall. There were people of color there. They spoke different languages. So the fact that I spoke German to her didn't seem to bother anybody. And, uh, and so I didn't feel it was necessary. But that every Black parent has to give a talk to their child about how to behave when they're stopped by a policeman. I mean, it's just heartbreaking that, that any parent has to do that. And so, you know, none of us have to tolerate one. 
I didn't have to tolerate anything like that. You know, I had only one uh, encounter with a policeman, and uh, you know, I showed him my license and I, I taught a thousand, and you know, I mean, it never even occurred to me that my life might be in danger. So, what we have to encounter, I, I think, is, you know, yes, it's not fun being <laughs> made fun of, you know, perhaps all the time. But the thing is, nobody ever clobbered me, right? And uh, it, I mean, each person has to live through that themselves in their own own way. For me, I think it was easier, you know, Chinese are small, I always wore glasses. <laughs> so, you know, people can't clobber you, at least in the old days, because you wore glasses. A and so it it's, uh, I don't know, I feel so blessed, you know, at, at 80, that I got through it all, that I, you know, everything yeah. is good. <laughs> <laughs> Life is good. Thank you so much. No, I, I absolutely agree with you. There's certain things that we do have to talk to the younger generation about, but there's certain things that we're privileged enough to ha not have to, um, you know, warn them of. Uh, and that really is a, a privilege that some people really need to, you know, evaluate that if you have this privilege that that speaks volumes about what's going on. Um, so thank you for thank you for your words. Um, what advice would you give students experiencing a similar journey to what you undertook who who have come here and are being you know maybe they're not having um you know uh, as easy of in the time accommodating um or acclimating um or just finding their place finding where they feel like they can be themselves what advice would you give them or to your students <laughs> that's interesting you know what advice would I give them? Stick it out. You know, uh, the thing is, there are, on the one hand, it was easy for me because I was often a m m minority of one, right? You just learn to be and nobody bothers you. On the other hand, there are l lots more, I mean, when I went went back to my 50th college reunion, you know, I told you there were eight Asians in our class of 1500. Okay? Now Harvard's 20% Asian American. Okay? To see all those, so so you have any person of minority, almost any person has some peers around. You're you're not the only one. Okay, and so I think there's help that way. I, I don't know. I mean, I, it's been so long since I've thought about belonging, okay. Uh, partly, if you're a minority of one, you learn not to care about b b b belonging so much, right? You develop somewhat of a hard skin and the thing is, as I said, though, people have been so good to me all my life that uh, all these villages I belong to have been accepting and it's... No, I, no I, I, I completely agree. And I just want to point out to you how um, we're receiving a lot of comments in the chat. I don't know if you're able to view it at the moment. Um, how everybody's so thankful for the series, uh, the story that you share, your story, uh, how important they feel it is, how amazing they feel it is. So thank you so much for um, uh, sharing that. It's been such an honor to have you. It's been such an honor to have all of our other storytellers for today. Um, you guys really helped make this festival. Um, you know, it really. You guys really helped bring it to fruition. You guys really helped. You know what our mission was, was to share exactly what you were saying, how we are all different in unique, unique ways, but how there are those similarities and we need to cherish our differences, but then cherish our similarities as well, because that is, that is how we exist. That is how we coexist. Um, so thank you so, so much. Um, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you so, so much. Thanks to all my friends in the audience there.
Yes, thank you for bringing them. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, to all our viewers, we are we have arrived at the end of tonight's uh, Our Stories program. I want to once again thank you um, to all our sponsors for supporting this program. Special thanks to Joanna Picor and Marisa Palgnuan for handling tonight's tech and Amy Bolt uh, for managing the chat. Uh, next week, we have the uh, fourth session of Our Stories Virtual Fester featuring um, Renu Narian, um, Pratagya Haran, Sonia um, Bharaja, Pun, uh, Punhani, and Priyanka Chatterjee. So please join us for that. I'd like to remind you to please, please, please complete the online event survey. Again, that is how we will know that we're doing our job right and how we will bring you programs uh, even for many years to come. Um, and please show your support with a donation to the Asian Arts and Culture Center. Again, we are self-sufficient. Every donation counts, even if it's just $1. It brings us closer to our goal to bring these programs to you and to everybody in the community. Thank you all and see you guys next week. <laughs>